Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 81. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. The Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn about knives and knife collecting. This is our midweek supplemental edition of the podcast where we get to dive deep into some of the knife stories in the news. But also coming up this week, we have a first tool segment and we'll also uh, give a preview or give some dates of upcoming knife shows uh, at the end of this month as well as February and looking into March a little bit. So, Bob, a a full show again this week on the Supplemental. Indeed. Supplemental is always a a good excuse to uh, kind of wax poetic about the new knives that are coming (laughs) out that I just I can't keep my eyes off or that I think are important. Right. Knife news. Any uh, any new knives in uh, in your hands or future? That you I, I do I, actually. Well, I have uh, both new knives in my hands and new well, knives in my do. future. <laughs> and uh, I I got the Launch Nine, the uh, Kershaw Automatic, the little diminutive uh, uh, automatic last week, and it hasn't left my pocket in that time. I'll get to that in a second. What I what I did want to mention in terms of new knives, though, um, are new knives out on the market and. Uh, Come, not quite out yet, but coming from Wee Knives and Todd Knife and Tool is the Root Kit, which is coming out. This new knife, the Root Kit, is so cool. It's got uh, it's got sort of the leaf shaped blade of the recent of their most recent release, but it has instead of that sort of wedge shaped handle, it has a more contoured handle. It still has sort of the futuristic lines to it, uh, milled in. Uh, into the carbon fiber, but it just looks like an amazing kind of low profile, but sizable blade sort of carry. In any case, uh, we talked about that a bit uh, Thursday Night Knives with Terrell, uh, half of the design team of that, Terrell Todd, uh, you know him as Zelric, and it just look, it's just a cool knife. I can't wait to get my hands on it. That was uh, last Thursday, January 23rd edition of uh, Thursday Night Knives, which is uh, the Knife Junkies live video show that you can see on both YouTube as well as the Knife Junkies Facebook page, where you can watch it on our website, thenifejunkie.com slash live. And on that page, thenifejunkie.com slash live, you'll also find an archive of the uh, past shows. So if you happen to miss one, catch them right there on thenifejunkie.com website. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast, and now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. As you know, this is SHOT Show season, and so a lot of uh, knife makers are coming out with their new designs for 2020 and presenting them at SHOT Show, and a lot of that news is trickling back to uh, our neck of the woods here, and there are, you know, I'm going to be talking about some of these new releases for weeks. But one that you know I'm very excited for is uh, the new Emerson releases. And they're only coming out with two new knives in 2020. And they're actually an expansion of an existing line, the Sheepdog line. Those were the first knives uh, that they came out with. There's a, a Bowie version and a Drop Point version. Those were the first Emersons to um, to have a flipper and I believe run on bearings. In any case, uh, they were one of the first anyway. And uh, so this this is an Emerson knife that has three ways of opening it. Of course, you have the wave because it's an Emerson. You have the thumb disc or you have the flipper. And uh, what they're coming out with now is the Sheepdog Mini. And these are mini versions of the Sheepdog, as you may imagine. They've been reduced. <laughs> hence the name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hence the name. They've been reduced in size to uh, uh, an overall of 7.1 inches. I believe they're uh, three and a quarter inch blades, and I'm sitting here, I'm I'm staring at them, and I never, I got to be totally honest, I'm a huge Emerson fan, as you know, never cared for the uh, for the sheepdog line. Uh, something about the lines on them didn't agree with my eye, but I'm sitting here staring at the mini versions, and they are both, both the Bowie and the Drop Point are very compelling and look like awesome knives, and. Uh, so maybe this will be how I dip my feet in the in the sheepdog line, but yeah. So you you, you know the real uh, unique selling proposition of this of these knives are the three opening uh, features: same steel, same G10, same setup as usual, same uh, 
titanium liners, but uh, just small. Just less lines for you to look at, so maybe that's the reason you like <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that. Sometimes, you know, you take a knife, you stretch it out, it looks weird, or you condense it, it looks weird. In this case, right. condensing this knife made it look better, in my mm. opinion. Okay. And you know I'm just shallow and I care about looks. You said it, not me. <laughs> Speaking of SHOT Show, uh, Kaiser, uh, they also had some uh, new releases. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, last week we talked about a couple of new Kaisers. Uh, one of them was the, the uh, Lundquist, the new Lundquist, uh, what was that called? The, uh, the airfoil or the, or the, some, something having to do with airplanes. Now I forget. <laughs> um, but the uh, mind is the first thing to go. <laughs> it is indeed. That went a while ago. Um, so, uh, but now that SHOT Show has begun, uh, we've, we're seeing everything that Kaiser is coming out with. And there are some pretty cool ones, and I just wanted to highlight a few of them. And uh, the one that I think is getting the most press, because it was first up on the Knife News article, and it seems to, this image seems to be going around, but it's the new Inversion by Dirk Pinkerton. Uh, Dirk Pinkerton is going to be coming on the podcast sometime in the near future. He's got some really great designs uh, from through Kaiser and then others of his own um, custom shop. But this inversion is really cool because it's kind of mm, kind of a Pical style knife. It looks like the blade is put in the handle backwards. You have, if you just look at the handle, you have the sort of typical contours and curves you'd see on the spine of a modern tactical knife. You know, it kind of swells up and then there's a little dip for your thumb and then on the uh on the posterior side there's a a big swell and then a groove it just looks like a regular tactical knife except the blade comes out of the top and then suddenly you realize the handle is what's inverted so when the um subtly hawk build beautifully worn clift blade pops out of this uh titanium frame lock flipper and you hold it in the traditional manner with your finger in that finger groove, the edge will be up instead of down. And uh, this facilitates certain ways of really of fighting. I mean, it's kind of like a an edge up Pical style of fighting or an edge in. If you have it in reverse grip and you hold this knife, uh, the handle in the natural manner and you have it in reverse grip, well, the edge will be facing in. And that's useful in some, you know, very specific kind of trapping and uh, knife fighting techniques that I know from Philippines, and I'm sure there are other reasons why that is practical. I just love it because it's a gorgeous knife. It's got this beautiful sort of uh, uh, stair-stepped uh, milled pattern, and the blade is is a knockout. But useful? Not so sure. But uh, great, great for the design design category in my collection. Okay, so... Like it for aesthetics and looks and, uh, you know, maybe how it feels, but uh, for for usefulness, low on the scale. Well. At least for the knife junkie. Extremely useful in those knife fights I get in. Oh, like, exactly. You know, yes. On yeah. a weekly basis. So if I keep oh, it yeah. on me, I'm sure I've, I'll be. I've lost count. <laughs> so the theme this year with Kaiser seems to be um, kind of um, dipping back into the stable and bringing back designers that they've had success with in the past and getting new knife, knife designs from them, but also reaching out to some uh, newer designers or other designers that they haven't worked with. Just going through the, the large list of new knives, I have to say, and this is just kind of my gut reaction, I do like Kaisers and I have a few. Or I, I'm down to one uh, and then a Tangram, but I do like Kaisers, but they tend to start looking the same to me, kind of like Benchmades. Like after a while, I can't keep them all straight and they all kind of have a semi-unique titanium frame lock look but after a while so this selection is kind of hopelessly kaiser to me a lot of unique designs mm. but they're like oh yeah okay that makes sense there's this one uh, the raja by sebastian Irwan that looks really cool this is what a standout design to me it has a very angular warncliffe blade kind of uh in that stout uh scout style of um uh, oh, who's that custom maker that Alex T likes so much? Well, if you're listening to this, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's got a very angular blade, but it's got a very curvy, um, ergonomic looking handle. So I like the juxtaposition of the curvy and the, and the angular. Uh, so that, that's a, that looks like a winner. There's a, a knife that looks like a, uh, 
totally looks like a folding kitchen knife, aptly called The Slicer by Michael <laughs> Galovic. That looks cool. Good name. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a bunch of others. Um, there's one by a designer. They have five, uh, four new knives by this designer, Azo, coming out. And one of them, called The Justice, looks just like uh, The Big Lighter. It just sort of reminds me of the very, very popular Kaiser Big Lighter. So it looks like it might be sitting on the same shelf with that. There's another one that came out that I wrote WTF next to. Um, <laughs> and and it's by a designer named Carlos Elst, Elstner. And it's a good-looking blade. Uh, this is not a – in any way am I impugning the, this design. But it's called The Assassin. Oh, my. And it's 3.15 inches. So, to me, there there are a couple of problems with this. First of all, you don't name a knife the assassin. It's a, just a little bit like, and so, sir, yes, judge, what were you carrying on that evening? I was carrying a pocket knife, sir. What's that for? It's for work, sir. What's that knife called? It's called the assassin, sir. It just <laughs> doesn't look good. So and the it's name... only three inches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's only three inches. So, that assassin's going to have to work hard. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. you know, so... But anyway, Carlos Elsner did design a beautiful knife. I mm. just uh, take exception to the name. So that's that's pretty much it from Kaiser. Right. Uh, don't get me wrong. There are tons of other knives, but those are the ones that really jumped out at me. Well, maybe uh, speaking about their design language, that a lot of them look similar or have the same style or whatever. Maybe Maybe that's intentional. Maybe they're good sellers, and so they want to – kind of pattern other knives after them? Is, does that make sense? You know what, Jim? I, it does make sense. And actually, I think they were guilty of that earlier on, maybe four years ago or so, four or five years ago. Now, I mean, legitimately, all of those knives look different. Mm-hmm. Some of them even have different handle material. But to me, the difference is predictably Kaiser. I look at it, I'm like, of course, that's a Kaiser knife. If I had to guess, I'd probably say, yes, that is different, but it's in a, different in a Kaiser kind of way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but- you know. But but there's nothing wrong with that, being able to kind of know who the maker is just by yeah. seeing certain things about it or styles or whatever. I mean, yeah. don't you do the same with some of your other knife brands? Well, yeah, for sure. Actually, I cannot disagree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. the knife the knife newbie is right. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Mark it down, people. That's right. <laughs> we'll, move on. <laughs> we'll, move, we'll move on quickly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before you find some way to uh, get out of that one. Hey, uh, Cold Steel, you want to mention that one uh, really briefly? Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to mention that I've seen a number of uh, videos. I've, you know, I know I've been talking Cold Steel to death because I'm so excited about their two new Chris Blades uh, coming out, the uh, the Voyager XL and the um, Tylite 6-inch. But I've been seeing a lot of the 4Max Scout online, especially uh, Jimmy Slash and a couple of other, a couple of other people. Uh, I've seen it. Uh, oh, oh, a Cold Steel video itself uh, with Andrew Demko on it. Anyway, as you know, the 4Max is the beefiest folder on the in, in the lineup over there at Cold Steel. There are plenty that are larger, but this is kind of the stoutest, if you will. And it's got a 4-inch blade, hence the, the name 4Max. But uh, in watching this uh, video with Andrew Demko, I learned that the Max refers to the fact that it's a 4-inch blade, but you also get 4 inches of cutting edge. He doesn't waste space with a choil or any of that. And in order to make the knife that big, it's actually an AD10 XL, but it looks a little different because the the AD10 handle, the the sort of straight format, doesn't really work with the size of the blade. It starts to feel just weird, so he had to curve the handle. In any case, the 4 Max is kind of an out of reach cold steel for many of us. It's a kind of a three hundred and fifty ish dollar blade. I I Mm. think it varies between you know. It varies. I think it, it might be less expensive at this point, but still kind of much for a cold steel, um, maybe many of us feel. And so this new one, the Scout version, comes in Aus 10 steel, which is a which is a more budget-friendly steel. And it comes with, instead of titanium liners, it comes with stainless steel liners. And instead of G10, it comes with Grivery. So all of the materials remain as stout as the former materials, with the exception of the steel. You know, the steel isn't isn't quite as good, but Aus 10 is a very tough steel, apparently. So, all in all, you're getting the same capabilities from the regular Formax in a in a budget friendly package. And I gotta say, uh, the Formax I was always kind of on the fence about, 
but now I, I think I know for, uh, you know, a third of the price of the original model, um, I could have this other one. So I think mm -hmm. I might get the Scout version. It's looking, mm -hmm. it's looking like that might right. happen. Okay. So on the list, but maybe not near the top of the list. Yes. I, I'd say in the Cold Steel list, it's four or five. <laughs> oh, wow. The Cold Steel 2020. Okay. Yeah. Got to get the two Chris knives first and then the sax. They have a cool, like, Viking right. sax blade. So. In addition to all the many other knives that are on your list. <laughs> yes. But, uh, <laughs> it's, all right. it's getting a little ridiculous. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. All right, back on the uh, Knife Junkie podcast. That was uh, Knife Life News, but uh, we teased it at the beginning of the show. Uh, uh, your Kershaw, Kershaw Launch 9 uh, automatic knife that you've had for what, a week now or so? A yeah, couple of weeks? and uh, I got it last week, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, I can't carry it outside of the house. So, when I've been at home... And why is that, Bob? Uh, well, because of the law. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're listening to the law now. The law, yeah. In, in your older age. Yes, I, exactly. As I age out, I'm listening to the law. And okay. So, when I come home, I grab the Launch 9, and it lives on my person, and it is such... A sweet little blade. It's, uh, it's this is my first uh, experience with the famed launch series by Kershaw. It's their uh, American-made automatic knives. They all have 154 cm blades and um, aluminum handles, and they're they're all out the side and have fantastic action. This one, this little launch nine, I love the aesthetics. It's a beautiful little futuristic design, but the blade is small. It's about it's about two inches long, and it's very thin, and then it's ground thin, and then it's got a fat edge, which means this thing is like a scalpel. And it's kind of shaped like a scalpel, actually, the blade. So it's just really had has me excited about automatic knives and also about checking out more Kershaw's uh, mm. of these launch knives. All right. So I've had it for a week, and it hasn't left my pocket. And that made me wonder, what is the history of switchblades? Hmm. All right. Well, we'll we'll get into that in just a second on our first tool segment. But I want to remind you to subscribe, if you're not already, to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel. Go to thenifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. Thenifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Here's some cool knife history with the Knife Junkies, the first tool. So it turns out that switchblades kind of uh, came into being in the mid-1800s in Europe. Primarily, it started in England, and there were some knife makers there trying to do a number of things, and one of those was uh, bayonets that were spring-loaded. Could rifles benefit from having a spring-loaded bayonet? That and also um, the, uh, the marriage of spring-loaded knives and uh, work knives started to uh, arrive in Europe at that time. So at this time, switchblades kind of uh, started developing a dual purpose in Europe. Sometimes they were used as uh, worker tools for those who needed a, a knife, uh, you know, bring, a, bring a blade to bear as quickly as possible. Uh, but others, uh, made in Italy and Spain, were known for their sort of fancy embellishment uh, on the handles and on the blades and on the bolsters and then different mechanisms for firing them and for locking them. So born of this idea of a spring-loaded bayonet came these spring-loaded knives for both gentlemen and for workers. Just in looking through some, some material on this, I discovered that at one point in time, uh, in the late 1800s, a word that was synonymous for switchblade was Campo Basso. Uh, and that was because in Campo, ba Campo Basso, Italy, they were making these knives. And it just so happens that uh, my grandmother is from Campo Basso, Italy. Wow. Uh, so it was what kind a of a coincidence, yeah. yeah. Cool thing to read. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe my knife junkiedom goes back <laughs> further than I know. Oh, yeah, there you go. You got it yeah. honestly. So, uh, back here in the States, right after the Civil War, okay, mind you, these are just bullet points. There is a very rich and complex history of switchblades, but these are just bullet points of history in, in researching this that really kind of stuck out to me. And one thing that was especially cool is in the United States after the Civil War, there were some pistol makers and some knife makers who were known for making pistols that had little switchblades at the end of them. So essentially, there were ba 
Yeah, ba- bayonets on the end of the pistol. Wow. So, uh, you know, uh, b- before repeaters were, were very popular, in case you run out of ammunition when you're shooting, you flip out that knife and you start stabbing, I, I-, I-, I presume. Uh, either that or, you know, just like you and I, or I, just like I and other knife junkies, buy knives that aren't necessarily practical or aren't necessarily uh, have any specific purpose, but we buy them for the cool design and for the right. show-off factor. Maybe back in the post-Civil War days, that's what guys did to show off. Hey, check out my pistol. Check this out. And then a switchblade comes out. You know, right, uh, right. So so maybe they were, they were thought of as um, kind of novelties then. Interesting. So at the end, so 1892, a very familiar name to us, Schrade, that's George Schrade, knife maker in New York, starts the New York Push Button Knife Company, producing automatic knives in a small shop, ironically, in where? New York City. So in the- <laughs> in Where the you most, lived. <laughs> yeah. Well, not only that, but the it's like the most prohibitive place on earth for knives, right. or at right. least in this country. And uh, and the Schrade Knife Company, which started as the New York Push Button Knife Company, started in uh, New York City. And so they were they were known for making a um, a number of different knives. And at this time, uh, a lot of American switchblades were designed like traditionals, like like slip joints, you know, two two bladed knives, right? So there was a an interesting mechanism used at that point. You know, these were not thought of as weapons. They were uh, marketed for far- to farmers and for, uh, you know, outdoorsmen and such. And that's why they took on the sort of outdoorsy, you know, uh, slip joint pattern. But you would press down on the pen blade, that's the smaller blade, and the larger blade would flick out. So uh, I thought that was kind of a cool, uh, cool mechanism. You know, I, I wouldn't mind seeing um, Great Eastern Cutlery come out with an automatic knife or the... Right. Or the the main blade pops out when you push down on the secondary one. Well, I can see that uh, that function being extremely useful for uh, tradesmen and workers and, you know, carpenters and, you know, just, just anybody kind of working in the field or in the yeah. trades, as you would say. It's just such a time, uh, time-saving time little little mechanism, little trick, you know. Exactly. And, and think about it. Back then, there were no uh, one-handed opening pocket knives. Spyderco hadn't invented the hole yet. <laughs> you know, and, and the thumb stud hadn't been invented or the flipper. So if you were a tradesman and you were on a ladder and you were holding something up with one hand and needed to open your knife with the other hand, mm-hmm. having an automatic knife was damn valuable. So yeah. so that's where they took off. Right. Now, we're going to flash forward to the 30s. And at the onset of World War II, the Germans developed the Fallschirmjäger, which is a cool Cool name. I'm sure you've got it right. I'm not even going to Jäger. <laughs> I think Jäger means ja- uh, like uh, stag, you know, like uh, I male, thought it was beer. male deer. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Well, <laughs> so they developed this beer, I mean this uh, switchblade for paratroopers. And it was in case they, uh, you know, they're, they jump out of an airplane, they deploy their parachute, they fall all the way to earth only to land in a tree and they're, they're hung up. So now they have a switchblade. They pull it out, they can cut themselves down. So it was a uh, it was a big hit, and the Americans decided the American Armed Forces, the Army, the U.S. Uh, Army Air Force, needed a, you know suddenly had a requirement for one of those two. Schrade put in a bid. They put out uh, what was later known as their civilian model, the Presto, which looks like a, a single bladed kind of a single bladed Barlow with a clip point blade. So this was accepted by the U.S. Army and. Uh, it it had the catchy name as Knife Pocket M2. Sounds like the military. Yeah, exactly. So that w- that was issued to paratroopers and apparently OSS, uh, Office of Strategic Service guys. That was the precursor of the CIA. So it kind of makes sense that they should have some cool automatic knife. And then after World War II, Italian stilettos became big in the United States. And that's what you and I know as switchblades. That's what I got my... My brother and father for Christmas that I was right. talking about that that very traditional switchblade look. It's got the quillions. It's got the long sort of bayonet ground blade, long and slender, and uh, and it's got the um, the symmetrical handle. It kind of looks like the medieval assassination weapon. So they started calling them stilettos. But uh, American GIs brought them back from Italy, and they became kind of fashionable among the less desirables, if you will. 
or, or at least that was the uh, that was the narrative put out by the media and the government. They did not take well to these knives. One or two news stories and it got blown up, kind of like today. You know, one or two news stories, it gets blown up and suddenly a politician finds a purpose and uh, whips whips the constituency into a lather and something gets, you know, outlawed. In this case, it was switchblades. It was this guy, Jack Harrison Pollock, who was actually, uh, he was a political operative. And he came out with an, an article in a popular woman's magazine called Woman's Home Companion. And uh, he he wrote this incredible screed about the switchblade. Uh, but one of the things he, he said was, designed for violence, deadly as a revolver, that's the switchblade. The toys youngsters all over the country are taking up as a fad. Press the button on this new version of the pocket knife, and the blade darts out like a snake's tongue. Action against this killer could be taken now. To back up his charges, Pollock quoted an unnamed juvenile court judge as saying, it's only a short step from carrying a switchblade to gang warfare. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I mean, geez. And imagine you have no place else to go because it's 19, what was it, 1954? And, uh, you know, there's not much media, so you're reading whatever you get. And you right. read that and you're like, oh my God. As Doug Ritter mentioned when we've had him on the show, a lot of these anti-knife laws came out of race hysteria. You know, like... Mm -hmm. uh, it's the juvenile delinquents, the African Americans, and the uh, and the Latinos who are causing all this trouble. Hollywood did its part, coming out with Rebel Without a Cause, Blackboard Jungle, Crime in the Streets, Twelve Angry Men, The Delinquents, High School Confidential, West Side Story. All of these knives, I mean, all of these movies helped to vilify the switchblade. So a bunch of legislation came through. A lot of uh, the knife industry, except for Schrade, kind of supported a lot of this stuff. And it was all in the excuse to stem gang violence in Chicago, of all places. Imagine that. The, the Switchblade Act of 1958. So anyway, that's how it all started. That's how it all became illegal. Thank God we have people like Doug Ritter and Knife Rights out there who have slowly but surely changed the majority of states' knife laws uh, in this country. There are a couple of holdouts. New York State ironically, is one of them, ironically, mm -hmm. because this is where a lot of it started. Right. And there's a lot of knife industry in that state, and also Virginia, which is just backwards. And that's this week's look at knife history with the first tool. And now, back to the Knife Junkie podcast. All right. Pretty cool uh, history lesson there on the first tool. And Bob, that's uh, that's one of my fa favorite segments that uh, we used to do a whole lot more that uh, I'm hoping we can start doing some more because... Uh, I like that history and kind of learning some of the stuff about why things are, and especially with knives as I'm I'm learning more here. Yeah, yeah, me too. You know, um, you and I were talking recently about ancestry and how if you really think about it, you and I have ancestors that go back three and a half billion years, you know, to the dawn of life on this planet. Literally, you can trace a line straight back. Well, when we look at the first tool and we, we talk about the history of knives, there is that same kind of lineage. One thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And then sooner or later, history is passed, and it's one straight line. Well, or it's one wavy line, right. but it's all connected. Yeah. Our podcast this week brought to you by G Suite. If you want to start running your business like a business and look like a business with a professional email address, Start using G Suite for free for 14 days. Start that free trial by going to thenifejunkie.com slash G Suite. That's G-S-U-I-T-E, thenifejunkie.com slash G Suite. After you start that trial, email me, Jim, at thenifejunkie.com. I'll email you a special code so that you can save 20% off your first year of G Suite, either G Suite Personal, or the, which is called the Basic Plan, or G Suite Business Plan. Uh, the basic starts at $6 a month, business plan just at $12 a month, but you're going to get like a whiteboard feature. You're going to get G Suite Keep, where you can organize and store your ideas. You're going to get slides for presentations, sheets for spreadsheets, docs for your documents, forms, Drive, secure file storage and sharing, and so much more. That's G Suite. Start your 14-day free trial by going to thenifejunkie.com slash G Suite. Bob, as we uh, start to get toward the end of the Knife Junkie podcast, one of the things we wanted to try to do is promote some of the knife shows coming up. So I'm only 
get to that really quickly. This weekend, uh, last of January, start of February, which happens to be a leap year this year, by the way. The Gator Cutlery Show, Friday, January 31st through Sunday, February 2nd. That's uh, down in Lakeland, Florida. GatorCutlery.com is where you can get more information. A lot of uh, February shows, including the uh, Las Vegas Custom Knife Maker Show. That's Friday, February 28th through Sunday, March 1st. That's at the Westgate Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. That'd be a nice place to be in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the, the major show in March, uh, in February. And then we look at March where we're starting to kind of get back into the, the busier knife show season. So a lot of them going on uh, in March. The Spirit of the Blade Custom Knife Show, March 6 and 7. That's in Troy, Ohio. You got the Track Rock Hammer Inn. That's in uh, Blairsville, Georgia. The Tar Heel Cutlery Club Show. That's March 20 through March 21st. That's a Friday and Saturday. That is in Hamptonville, North Carolina. Then we move to Arkansas, the Arkansas Knife Show, also uh, Saturday, March 21st. That's at the State House Convention Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. Then we kind of go back down south for the Dalton, Georgia Knife Road Show, Friday, March 27 to Saturday, March 28. That's in Dalton, Georgia. And then uh, up to or out to Illinois, if you will, the Bunker Hill Knife Club Show. Friday and Saturday, March 27 and March 28th, again in uh, Godfrey, Illinois. And a note about that one, that's a, a new location for this year at the Altonwood River Sportsman Club in Godfrey. So a lot of great knife shows coming up as we're uh, getting ready, coming off a uh, shot show and kind of leading the road down to the blade show. So, uh, Jim, in shot show season, I am uh, I'm resolving to not get too excited about too many knives until they've been out for a while and I have a chance to have that cooling off period. Hmm. I think this year I'm going to be slightly more disciplined in my buying. Okay. So you're still uh, still got that New Year's resolution and still kind of holding yeah. strong to it. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I uh, In spirit, I'm always there, but you know how things accumulate and then you have to purge. It's, it's Right. You know, it's just harder to do with these wonderful, wonderful devices. Well, we'll uh, maybe get an update on an upcoming uh, supplemental show, maybe talk a little bit about uh, some of the new knives you've bought as well as uh, some of the recent ones you've sold as you can kind of continue on that uh, reduce and refine uh, mantra, if you will. So uh, maybe something to come up. Hey, really quickly before we head out of here, uh, tomorrow night, if you're listening to this podcast when it comes out on Wednesday, tomorrow, Thursday, January 30th, the uh, Thursday Night Knive Show. Uh, which is the live show on YouTube and the Knife Junkies Facebook page. So don't miss that. And then this coming Sunday, February 2nd, it's going to be episode 82 of the Knife Junkie podcast. That's our weekend interview show. And Bob, another YouTube reviewer that you're going to have a chance to talk with. Yeah, I got a chance to talk with Slicey Dicey, one of my uh, new favorites from the last two years or so. And uh, man, his channel has caught on like wildfire. Good conversation, so look for that in your uh, podcast feed on Sunday, February, tw uh, February 2nd, if I can talk. <laughs> All right, I think that's going to do it for our midweek supplemental. A lot of uh, information here this week. Final word from the Knife Junkie, Bob, before we uh, wrap it up here on episode number 81. Keep them strapped. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Point, point.